Welcome to Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Columbus. Our guest in this edition is retired U.S. Army Major General Patrick Henry Brady. General Brady served two tours of duty in Vietnam as a dust-off helicopter pilot responsible for flying in and evacuating wounded service members, usually under heavy enemy fire. For his tireless dedication to rescuing our men under fire on January 6, 1968, Brady was awarded the Medal of Honor. Patrick Henry Brady was born in South Dakota in 1936, but he mostly grew up in Washington State. In high school, Brady was a standout athlete and was fielding college scholarship offers, but he had a very different goal on his mind, and that led him down a rather tumultuous road as an ROTC student at Seattle University. Well, when I came out of uh, high school, uh, I went to an all-boys Catholic high school, and I had several scholarship offers to play football at different universities around the Northwest. But at the time, I was stalking this foxy chick, and she was going to a university uh, that Jesuit University that did not have a football team. So rather than lose her, I decided that I would go to the same university she went to. And when I got there, I found out they had ROTC, and it was mandatory, and I hated it. I did not like the idea that they could force me to wear a uniform and say, sir, to these kids around the campus. Uh, and so I didn't do well. And in fact, they booted me out. They told me to go to uh, summer camp one summer, and I decided I would go to Alaska in it instead. And so I went to Alaska to earn some money to go back to school. And then I married the foxy chick. And so she talked me into, she said, you need to go back and finish ROTC. And they actually took me back, a great, great, leader there, a guy named Major Snyder, he said, we'll give you a second chance, Brady. And so they took me back into ROTC, and I was commissioned, and went into the military, did my basic training here, my first assignment was in Berlin, Germany. Brady's time in Berlin would have a major impact on how he viewed our nation and the world. While he was stationed there, the communists erected the Berlin Wall, and he saw firsthand how many lives were thrown into misery. Well, I, of course, I remember most the fact that I was there before the wall, and I was there during the wall, when they built the wall, and after the wall. The most amazing thing about it was that before the wall, there was free access to all the sectors of Berlin. There were four different sectors of Berlin. The East was controlled by the Russians and the East Germans. The West was controlled by the French, the British, and the Americans. Free passage. One day we woke up and there was barbed wire across the city. That was the 13th of August, 1961. And all of a sudden they started to build a wall around their own people. And I'm a young second lieutenant and platoon leader and they're shooting their own people off the wall and my medics are cleaning up the mess. And this is when I first confronted communism. We had a babysitter who was engaged to be married to a gentleman in the East. She never saw him again. Our maid parents were in the East and she was not allowed to go to their funeral. So that woke me up. Before that, I had no idea of what communism was, how evil it was or anything about it and it just kind of woke me up. And uh, I still had no aspirations of making the military a career, but I served with some great soldiers in Vietnam. Norm Schwarzkopf, my commander was a guy named Fred Wyan, later became Chief of Staff of the United States Army, and they were really extraordinary individuals. And I thought, geez, it might not be bad to grow up and be like one of those guys. So I went to, then from there, they sent me to flight school and I incurred an obligation. So kind of kept me in the military. At flight school, Brady learned to fly helicopters. But at first, he nearly failed to graduate. I uh, <clears throat> did my initial training at Camp Walters, Texas, uh, which is where they trained helicopter pilots. It didn't... Uh, it's kind of an accident that I actually got to flight school. They didn't know what to do with me. I was kind of 
between assignments, and so they sent me to flight school. Difficult to get in in those days, really. And uh, I loved it because I got extra pay for being in flight school. And uh, the problem, though, was that my, my IP thought I was dangerous, and it wasn't, didn't look like I was going to graduate. In fact, the day that I was supposed to solo, uh, he got out and he said, I'll give you one chance, and he put another IP in with me, and he took me around the flight pattern just one time, and he says, okay, you can solo. So I was within a few minutes of busting out of flight school. I was not a natural. He thought I was dangerous, but I did really enjoy it. One of the reasons helicopters were hard to fly is because of the tremendous coordination it took to keep the choppers in the air. In those days, the helicopters required both feet, both hands, and a wrist. You had a motorcycle grip in your left hand and uh, the power lever was in your left hand. Every time you moved one limb or your wrist, you had to move all the other three. So it was kind of like a harmony. Uh, and you had to be very, very well coordinated in those days to fly that kind of a helicopter. And so I would say that, that simple coordination, physical coordination was very important. And also your eyes were very important. Your vision was very, very important. And so I was blessed with good vision. I had reasonable coordination uh, once I caught on to it. But it took me a little while to catch on to the various movements required to fly a helicopter, including the motorcycle grip. Now the bad thing about that was it's the, it was backwards from a motorcycle. So when you added power in a helicopter, you turned it one way, and when you added power in a motorcycle, you turned it the other way. So I pretty much fell off every motorcycle I tried to drive after I started flying helicopters. The dust-off pilots were not new. As Brady explains, the concept actually began in World War II, but his mentor, Charles Kelly, took that part of the service to a new level. It changed over the years. Uh, the development of uh, helicopter ambulance on the battlefield initially started in Burma in World War II, but it was not in any way effective or efficient or uh, sophisticated. Then they went to Korea where they had the MASH type helicopters with the pods. And they would put the patient in that pod outside the helicopter where they couldn't treat him or monitor his condition en route to the hospital. Some of the patients would wake up in that pod and they thought they were in a coffin. And it cost, caused them a little problem. Now by Vietnam, we had the Huey, which was the, it was like, Coming out of the helicopters before the Huey was like going from a Model A to a Rolls Royce. It was a beautiful machine. You could treat the patient en route. The problem was we didn't know yet how to handle it on the battlefield. And so initially in Vietnam, our mission was simply Americans. There were 16,000 of them in 1964. And that was it even though most of the casualties in those days were being suffered, suffered by the Vietnamese people. And so uh, we had a commander, a guy named Charles Kelly, who was an incredible soldier, probably the greatest individual soldier I've ever known, veteran of World War II, kind of an irascible Irishman. He was court-martialed three times in World War II, almost died in one battle, but he came to Vietnam to command this unit. They decided, Stillwell, General Stillwell, decided he would use our helicopters for ash and trash, and then when there was a patient, he'd put a red cross on it. Kelly said, no, no, you can't do that. Now, you got a major going up against a general, both of them World War II veterans. Kelly did not back down. Our mission was in doubt uh, until the day Kelly was killed. And when he was killed, that changed everything. It took his life. He went in to pick up an American. Uh, they came under fire. They told him, get out. He said, when I have, you're wounded. And boom, he took one bullet through the open door, right through the heart, killed him on the spot. He froze, destroyed the helicopter. They dragged him out. Doctor was on board, broke the doctor's leg, and the rest of them were hurt too bad. 
So I was on my way down there when we heard he was done. And in fact, I replaced him as commander of that unit that day, that night, I slept in his bunk. In fact, I went into that area where he had been killed a few minutes after he was shot to get the patients that he was killed trying to get. I got him out, although we got shot up on the first approach. Uh, but we did get him out, and the American who we went to pick up walked to the aircraft with a R and R bag in his hand. He wasn't urgent or anything else. So, but it didn't matter. He, Kelly would have gone after him anyhow. Brady says Major Kelly was a man of great physical and moral courage. He was also a great innovator who challenged conventional wisdom about evacuations and treatment, and paved the way to a much more effective service. Well, his style was uh, first of all that he opened the doors to any wounded soldier, Vietnamese or American or enemy. And so that meant he flew a lot. So he got a lot of practice, we all did, trying to keep up with him. We all got a lot of practice flying on a battlefield under fire to pick up patients. And we also were the only unit in, in Vietnam at that time who flew at night. The other aviators thought it was insane to fly a single ship unescorted helicopter at night in combat, but he did it. He opened the doors to that. People get hurt at night. In fact, it's safer to fly at night, and as well as they do in the daytime, and why would they lay in the mud overnight when you can fly out there and pick them up and get them in the hospital right away? So he, he and then at the same time, the crew members the medic on board that helicopter is learning how to treat traumatic injuries on the fly. In other words, you've got <clears throat> amputees, people who get a leg or arm blown off, put them in the helicopter, you, he, they, would, they could actually start an IV on a helicopter. Some of those medics, very good, tracheostomies in a helicopter on the way to the hospital. So they became very skilled in, in emergency life-saving methods as based on the fact that we were carrying all kinds of patients. When Kelly was killed, Brady took his place. A superior officer tried to get Brady to renounce Kelly's approach to flying and evacuating, and Brady would have none of it. And the battalion commander called me in that day, and he said to me, he said, you know, I knew somebody was going to get killed the way you people were flying, he said, but I didn't think it would be Kelly. I thought it would be one of the younger pilots because all of us were inexperienced right out of flight school. And so I said, no, we're not gonna change a thing. We're gonna keep on flying the same way he taught us because we don't know any other way. And then when I left, he gave me, he actually gave me the bullet that killed Kelly. I have it to this day. But in any event, uh, that's it. We, we kept flying the way we, we've always flown and, and because we didn't know any other way. And Kelly taught us, and as I said, he set the example, and his moral courage saved dust off and hundreds and hundreds of thousands of lives as a result. One man, one man, made an incredible difference. The survival rate because of Kelly in Vietnam if you were shot in the jungle of Vietnam, your survival chances were greater than if you were in a, a crash on a highway in America. That's how effective that helicopter was in that war. And Brady says the legacy of Charles Kelly is alive and well with medical evacuation pilots to this very day. Yeah, his, his by the way, his dying words, when I have your wounded, set the standard for dust off to this day. And you will not find one dust off pilot anywhere in the world, helicopter ambulance pilot, who does not use those words as his motto to this day. When we return, much more with retired U.S. Army Major General and Medal of Honor recipient Patrick Henry Brady. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. This is Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest this week is retired U.S. Army Major General Patrick Brady. He served two tours of duty as a dust-off medical evacuation pilot in Vietnam. As we mentioned earlier, flying these helicopters took a great deal of skill and coordination. And the North Vietnamese and Viet Cong made that job much harder on just about every mission. We were under fire every day. 
Every day that we went into an area to pick up patients, we were picking them up on the battlefield. After Kelly came, he, he opened the gates for the Vietnamese patients. So we no longer sat on the ground and waited till an American was wounded before we went out. Kelly was the 49th American killed. Out of eventual number, it would be 58,000. So they didn't fly much before that. But once we started picking up Vietnamese from the battlefield, we flew every day, every night, and we were under fire most of the time. So the key then was to find a way to stay alive. And so we developed different flying techniques, approaches, and signals with the people on the ground to figure out how we can get in there and get the patient out and stay alive. And so one of the initial things, a very simple thing, was the guy on the ground would say, dust off, red smoke is out. And you look down there from about 2,000 feet and you'd see three or four red smokes. Guess what? The communists were listening to us. And when they heard red smoke, they popped smoke hoping we would fly into their area. And that happened a few times too. So we said, let's do it this way. You pop smoke, I'll identify the color. And then you confirm that I have the right smoke and the right color, and then we'll come on in. So that's one simple example of how you learn as you go to keep alive on the battlefield. And then after that, we developed different approaches, overhead spiral, as fast as you could fall, as quick as you could get there, a low-level fast approach over the terrain, to use the terrain as cover and concealment as you went into an area. The terrain would drive everything. And so we would ask the guy on the ground, where's the enemy? What weapons does he have? And, uh, and then from that information, we would develop a, a highway. would actually spring out of the sky and say, we're going to go down to the ground. We're going to drive up this dry riverbed. We're going to hop over those trees. We're going to turn our tail into the fire, and we're going to sit down and you're going to load the patient just as quick as you can and so we can get out of there. But while enemy fire brought additional danger to each mission, Brady says the excellent work of medics on the ground were a huge help in getting people evacuated quickly and saving lives. The most important thing is that they're ready when you get there, that the medic on the ground has done the most he can for them, stop the bleeding, protect the wound, treat for shock, in essence, what you do is you make sure he's getting one thing, air, and you protect what he's got of the other thing, blood. And then you get him on the helicopter, and then our medic goes to work on him and, and does more work on him, and he's going, to be, he's going to be in the hospital in 15 minutes. He's going to be in an operating room, and, and from the time a guy was shot in our area until we had him in an operating room, the average time was 33 minutes. So no matter what condition, he could be a double amputee, he could be anything. And if he wasn't already dead, the chances were 99% that he, that he was going to live because we were going to have him in an operating room very, very quickly. Brady served with the 57th Medical Detachment during his first tour in Vietnam from 1964 to 1965. When he came back for his second tour in 1967, Brady found a very different war. So, incredible difference. As I said, Charles Kelly was uh, the 49th American killed in combat, 16,000 Americans in country. When I came back in 1967, much had changed. There was about 500,000 Americans in country, and they were killing that many every week. So, the worst part of it was that we were in the mountains, in tough terrain, and I had... 12, well, I had 11 other pilots. Most of them had graduated from flight school on the same day. There was no checkout. There was no nothing. When they got to Vietnam and we got our helicopters, they started flying combat. So in this case, most of our patients were Americans, and we had to deal with weather, and we had to deal with mountains, and we had to deal with pilots who were totally inexperienced. On his second tour, Brady found himself as second in command of the 54th Medical Detachment. He says over the course of nine months, the unit suffered many casualties and lost helicopters. But he also says they saved a staggering number of lives. 
We were based at Chulai, which is about 20 minutes south of Da Nang, which is a big city in the northern part of South Vietnam in those days. We had a 40-man detachment. We had uh, six helicopters. And to give you an idea of the workload, and you can do kind of do the numbers on this, but in a nine and a half month period, with three flyable aircraft, we had an aircraft shot up by enemy about every four or five days. 117% of our aircraft were shot up every month. In that 40-man detachment, there were 26 Purple Hearts. That means 26 people were wounded out of the 40-man detachment. In that nine and a half month peri period, despite all those adversities, we carried over 21,000 patients. That was more than were carried by helicopter in the entire Korean War and as just one unit. All the other dust off units were doing the same thing. Thousands and thousands of patients, saving thousands and thousands of lives. When we come back, General Brady will tell us about January 6th, 1968 and the actions that day that resulted in him being awarded the Medal of Honor. Stay with us. We're back on Veterans Chronicles. I'm Greg Corumbus. Our guest in this edition is retired U.S. Army Major General Patrick Henry Brady, who served two tours of duty as a dust-off pilot in Vietnam. On January 6, 1968, Brady's dedication to evacuating those in need above and beyond the call of duty would result in him receiving the Medal of Honor. The conditions were very difficult that day. Fog shrouded the area amidst the mountains, and of course the enemy was lurking and firing as usual. But Brady was ready for the challenge, because he had figured out how to navigate these conditions on an earlier mission. I was scared to death of the weather uh, and the mountains and the fact that they were going to start killing our pilots, because we were losing more pilots to accidents at night and in weather than the enemy was killing. So I got a call one day from a young trooper who was on a mountaintop and he'd been bitten by a snake. In, in the afternoon, the clouds would come down over the mountains about halfway down. So complete zero visibility. Underneath it, clear visibility. But in order to get to the kid on the mountaintop, we had to go into the clouds. No radar control, no letdown facilities, no nothing. And so I came into the clouds knowing I could fall out into the valley and I would be visual, but I didn't have any idea how I was gonna get that kid out. In the meantime, I'm praying like crazy to asking the good Lord to show me how to do it. The crew is nervous. They're screaming at me on the ground. He's going into convulsions, dust off, please, please. I told him we got to try it one more time. So we went back around, back up the mountain, into the soup, and I was blown sidewards. The, that was the breath of God. And I looked out my window. I was looking for a hole in the jungle. I thought we were going to crash. And I could see the tip of the rotor blade, and I could see the top of the trees. So guess what? I knew I was right side up. So I turned that thing sidewards, up the mountain, into the area, got the kid, got him to the hospital, and I think he lived. That was a technique from that moment on, low valley fog, afternoon buildup, two reference points, sidewards, and you can get in. They can't stop us. And so the day of the Medal of Honor action, they called me because it was one of those missions and they knew I could fly it. On the morning of the 6th, Brady was awakened because approximately 90 of our South Vietnamese allies were in need of evacuation in two different locations. Because of the prior experience he just talked about, Brady was the only man for the job. And so I went into that area and picked that, those Vietnamese up and it was not a problem. They had 70 patients in another location, also under low valley fog. And so we went out there and we got all them out using the same technique. They tried to follow me in, but they didn't know how to do it. And so I had to go get them all by myself. And Brady says once he figured out how to fly in those conditions, flying in the fog was actually a huge advantage against the enemy. The fog was perfect 
perfect protection from the enemy because he could not see more than 20 feet in that stuff. Now, on one of the missions, we went and we flew right over the top of him and whole, an NVA unit was laying in the mud right under us, but he, we were only about 15, 20 feet off the ground, but he couldn't see us or until we got there, he could see us and before he could do anything, we were gone. So it was perfect, perfect protection. You just had to know how to do it. As the day wore on, many more evacuations were needed. And while Brady and the other pilots were normally allowed to use their own discretion when deciding if it was safe to land, this time his commanders insisted it was too dangerous. Most of the time it was my decision, but the day 6 January they tried to stop me. And when they wouldn't let me, they wouldn't give me the frequency of the people on the ground with the patients. There were supposed to be 70 patients in there. And they wouldn't have been in fire fight all night. They shot down several aircraft. And as I said, I was not on duty until they called me for the first mission in the fog. And so we had to land at the outpost on the mountain. And I had to go to the brigade commander. He says, I'm not, I'm not going to lift artillery. Uh, and I don't think you can get in there. And I said, we just did it. We just did it, an identical mission. And he said, well, I'm not going to lift the artillery. And so go do it if you want. And so we did. They sent four aircraft to follow us, as I said before, and they lined up behind me, but they all turned back, which was a good thing because I would not want to be in the fog with a bunch of guys who didn't know what they were doing. By the third mission of the day, the enemy was having more success in targeting Brady's helicopter. And while Brady and his crew did make it back to base, the chopper was done for the day. Well, what happened was we didn't know. We went into the area and uh, we got shot up, but we didn't know how bad the aircraft was damaged. So we jumped out of the area, we went up to altitude, checked it out. The instruments were good. The aircraft was seemed to be flying good. And so we went back in and we got the patients. When we got back to the base, they found out that the controls were partially shot away. So we had to, they were just hanging on by the skin of our teeth. Uh, so, but anyhow, we had to get another helicopter, and then we went out again. Later in the day, Brady had to land in a minefield to rescue wounded servicemen. The dangers were obvious, and the detonation of one mine would add to the casualties. But once again, Brady's ingenuity and resourcefulness made completing the mission possible. The interesting thing about <clears throat> the minefield was we were not on that mission. Another dust-off aircraft had that mission. And as we were coming over the top, there was a lot of traffic about wounded in the minefield. Everybody was apparently dead or wounded. And a mine went off beside the helicopter that was sitting on the ground, the dust off, and it left the area. And so I saw where that helicopter was sitting. I knew just about exactly where its skid marks were. So I knew that if I could hit those skid marks, I wouldn't set off a mine when I landed. Two things landing, one, if you, if you land on a mine or it's command detonated, that's a problem. But the other thing was <clears throat> the rotor, when you change power, the downdraft can set off a mine. So I hit the spot right on the mark. Things are going good, nobody will move. My, my medic and crew chief, I turned to him and I said, go get him. They jumped out of that helicopter and they started dragging people to the helicopter through the minefield. Nobody would help them, nobody would move. And so on one of the trips, they set off a mine, <clears throat> blew them up in the air, filled the aircraft with shrapnel, lights came on, they landed, they had a patient on a litter and I think he took most of the shrapnel from the mine. Although some people think it was command detonated, I don't know. Uh, but in any event, they got up, they got the rest of the patients loaded, got them on the aircraft. We took them to the hospital, including my two crew members who were wounded. And uh, then we had to go get another helicopter. Brady was decorated for his actions that day, but it would be many months later that he learned he would be receiving the highest possible award for valor. I was, uh, I got a call from Westmoreland's office one day and he said, uh, congratulations, uh, this is a Major Scott. Congratulations, you're gonna get the Medal of Honor. Now I had already gotten my second Distinguished Service Cross, which is second highest award. And uh, had a ceremony and everything. I didn't think anything about the Medal of Honor, 
But what they did is they upgrade, it was an interim award while they processed the Medal of Honor. It took two years to process it. And so I was, I was completely surprised. But the beautiful thing was that uh, you got to bring your family and I got to bring a lot of my friends to the White House for the ceremony. And that was great. On October 9th, 1969, President Richard Nixon placed the Medal of Honor around Brady's neck. But Nixon had one more special experience waiting for Brady and the other recipients at the White House that day as well. The thing I remember was that I was just really kind of embarrassed because when I stood up there at the guys, there were three other guys with me, I thought, what's going on here? You know, the, everybody, the people in my unit, every other pilot except for the weather missions, they, every other pilot in that unit did the same thing I did, got shot down as many times as I did, carried as many patients as I did, almost, because I had a year on them. And, uh, and so I was just, just a little bit embarrassed. The most interesting thing about the whole ceremony was that President Nixon said before the ceremony, he said, you know that the Medal of Honor Society is meeting at the uh, Shamrock Hotel in Houston, Texas. We didn't know what the Medal of Honor Society was. And he said, well, let, those are the living recipients of the medal. At that time, there was like 400 of them. They went back to the Boxer Rebellion. And uh, would you like to go? To the, because now tomorrow, after this ceremony, you will be members of that society. And we said, sure, how will we get there? He says, take Air Force One. So he put us on his airplane, which was not Air Force One when he wasn't on it. But so we went down there and we walked into that crowd and there was Bob Hope and Dinah Shore and Scooter Burke and Eddie Rickenbacker and Jimmy Doodlittle and Commando Kelly and Joe Foss and all these incredible heroes from as ba far back as I said, the Boxer Rebellion, the Indian Wars, and here we are, four young troopers and they're all out there to greet us and uh, it was just a great experience. Decades later, General Patrick Brady is grateful to have served and for the adventure his career provided for his family. But he says he is most proud of the American servicemen who got to go home because of the work he did. That's the, the premier accomplishment of my life. Not the medals, not anything else, but the fact that we were able to, to rescue that many people. Many of them would have died otherwise and uh, just think of all the the families that uh, and all the children from those families that lived because of what we did there's thousands and thousands of more people on this earth <laughs> that started out with 5,000 now there's no telling how many there are but perhaps the most important mindset Brady took away from his many years in uniform was the importance of service I think service is is the thing that stands out and I think that uh, I, was a, I was a reluctant soldier, God knows. I didn't want anything to do with the uniform or the military or anything about it. And had I not gone to Berlin, had I not been forced to join the military, had I not had to do things that I didn't want to do and would have never done if it was up to me, uh, the lesson was that I wouldn't trade a minute of it. It was the greatest thing that ever happened to me. And I think that young people today need to have that same opportunity to serve their country, uh, to do something for somebody else besides themselves, which is what military service is all about. Soldiers, they believe that life has no meaning unless it's lived for the benefit of future generations. That's what it's all about. That's why they protect America. It's not for just for them, it's for future generations. And so everybody should have a little bit of that in them, I think. And the one place to get it is in the military where they train in grain and make you believe that. And so that's, what, that's the way you live your life as a soldier. Retired U.S. Army Major General Patrick Brady. He served two tours in Vietnam as a dust-off medical evacuation pilot. And he's also a recipient of the Medal of Honor. I'm Greg Corumbus, and this is Veterans Chronicles. Hi, this is Greg Corumbus, and thanks for listening to Veterans Chronicles, a presentation of the American Veterans Center. For more information, please visit AmericanVeteransCenter.org. 
You can also follow the American Veterans Center on Facebook and on Twitter, we're at AVC Update. Subscribe to the American Veterans Center YouTube channel for full oral histories and special features. And of course, please subscribe to the Veterans Chronicles podcast wherever you get your podcasts. Thanks again for listening, and please join us next time for Veterans Chronicles.